Okay, so today we're going to be taking a notes one on simplifying radicals. Now, if you don't have your note packet or you're choosing not to use it, then you want to just make sure to clearly label the top of the page notes one um, so that you can stay organized and know kind of where you're at in our sequence um, for the next couple of weeks. So the first thing we're going to talk about in geometry is just a refresher on how to simplify radicals. So we simplified rads in Algebra 1. Um, we spend an entire unit learning how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide radicals. We don't need to get quite that involved um, in geometry, but we certainly um, encounter answers that are um, that are radicals in geometry. So when we do the Pythagorean theorem or the distance formula, um, and when we get to write triangle trig further on in the, in the course, we simplify radicals. And so in order to simplify radicals, we need to kind of have this base knowledge of what our perfect square numbers are. So I'm just going to list out perfect square numbers. And so when I say a perfect square, that means that when I take the square root of that number, it's going to be an integer. For example, the square root of four, that's a perfect square number because the square root of four is two. Now, just a little reminder from algebra one, when we're doing radicals, it's the inverse of our exponents. So the reason that the square root of four is two is because two squared is four. They have this kind of inverse relationship. And so our next perfect square on our list would be nine the square root of nine is three because three squared is nine. The square root of 16 is four and 25 is five, 36 is six, the square root of 49 is seven and so on. So we're just going to create a list here Of our perfect square numbers and so if you need to pause the video so that you can write down this list to match mine okay these are just the first kind of few perfect square numbers now we use our perfect square numbers to simplify radicals because rads have this product property where we can break apart a radical into its factors and so for example if I have the square root of 500 and I want to simplify that radical, I'm asking myself the question, which one of these numbers is a factor of 500? And so for 500, I can break 500 into the square root of 100 times the square root of five, right? Because five times 100 is 500, okay? So I can take this number and I can break that apart into its factors. And of course there's other factors of 500, right? Like I could do 50 times 10, but 50 times 10 wouldn't help me at all because 50 and 10, neither of those numbers are perfect squares. So when I'm using the product property to simplify, I am intentionally finding a factor of that number that is a perfect square number. And so I've broken 500 into 105 and now I'm going to simplify this radical by taking the perfect the the <laughs> taking the square root of 100, which is 10, and leaving that radical that's not a perfect square 5. So the square root of 500 simplifies to 10 rad 5. We're going to look at a few other examples. So again, the big idea here is that when I'm simplifying radicals, I'm asking myself the question what perfect square number is a factor? Okay, so what perfect square number is a factor of 75? Factor meaning it divides in evenly. And so looking at my list of perfect squares up here, I can see that 75 is 25 times 3. And the reason I'm choosing 25 is because 25 is a perfect square. Square root of 25 is 5. So the square root of 75 simplifies to 5 rad 3. When I look at 45, and again asking myself this question, I know that 45 can be broken into 9 times 5. The square root of 9 is 3. 
and I leave my rad five. Now we want to make sure that we're simplifying it all the way. So like three and five, these are prime numbers. And so I know that nothing else is going to fit into the radical that's left behind. But when I get to some other um, numbers, for example, 300, there's maybe more than one way that you could think about breaking down 300. And you, using perfect squares, there's more than one perfect square that goes into that. And so you want to find the largest perfect square value that will fit into your, your radicand, this number underneath the radical sign. And so looking at 300, the largest perfect square number that's going to fit into 300 similar to 500 here, would be to take um, 300 and break it into 100 times 3. The square root of 100 is 10, leaves me with 10 rad 3. And I know that this is simplified all the way because there is not any perfect square number that fits into 3. When I look at 20, perfect square that goes into 20 would be to take 20 and break it into 4 times 5. Square root of 4 is 2, leaves me with 2 rad 5. Now this last example here, um, 32, you may initially want to break that into 4 times 8, which wouldn't be incorrect, but 4 is not the largest perfect square factor of 32. And so if I broke four, 32 into 4 and 8, which we don't want to do, but if I had taken 32, and gone four times eight, and I'm like, okay, that's a perfect square. So it becomes two rad eight. Now this is not simplified all the way because eight has a, something that, a perfect square that divides evenly into it. So eight is four times two. So this isn't simplified all the way because eight still has a perfect square factor. So if I had done that, I, I could keep going and break that eight apart and then simplify again. So then I'd have this square root of four becomes two rad two, okay? It gets really complicated though, and usually that doesn't really go too well for students. And so you wanna just be really thoughtful to say, well, okay, four times eight, but is there, is there something larger than four that goes into 32 that's a perfect square? And the answer to that is yes, 32 can be 16 times two, the square root of 16 is four rad two, which is the same answer I got here, and I'm hoping that doesn't confuse you too much. Okay, but you wanna make sure that you're taking out the largest perfect square. And if you didn't take out the, larger perfect, the largest perfect square, then you could keep going and you could keep simplifying. So one place that we will see the um, simplifying of radicals come into play and something that, again, is reviewed from Algebra 1 is the Pythagorean Theorem. So there were certain times in Algebra 1, and really even going back to like middle school math, where we saw the Pythagorean Theorem. And so the Pythagorean Theorem we use only with our right triangles. Is this true, right? So you got to be thinking about right triangles. Pythagorean Theorem says that the legs of my right triangle, which we call A and B, so A squared plus B squared, the legs of that right triangle is equal to c squared, or what we call the hypotenuse of that right triangle. Now what's important with the Pythagorean theorem is that we put the right part in the right place in the equation. Okay, so it's important that we understand that a squared and b squared is talking about the legs. So when I have a right triangle, here's my right angle, the hypotenuse is the slanted side or the side across from my right angle. Then I also have these other two sides of my triangle, and these are called the legs of my triangle. And so placement is important in this equation in that we make sure our hypotenuse is on this right-hand side. So when I look at my first example of the Pythagorean theorem, I'm given my legs. And what's unknown is my hypotenuse, so that's where my variable is. So I know the legs of my right triangle are four and five, and I want to determine what my hypotenuse is. That's what we use the Pythagorean theorem for. So given any two sides of a right triangle, I can find the third side using this theorem. So I have five squared plus four squared, A and B 
the legs of my triangle squared is equal to my hypotenuse squared, x squared. 5 squared is 25, 4 squared is 16. And then, so again, so going back again, algebra one, it's all coming into play right now. We need to think about order of operation. So we can't just add them together first. We have to do exponents first, and now we'll add. So 25 plus 16 is gonna give me 41. And we learn um, in algebra class all about inverse operations to solve for our variable. So if I have x squared, and I wanna get this down to just x equals some number, right? I want to know what x equals. Then I have to do the inverse of what's happening here. And the inverse of squaring something is to take the square root. Whatever I do to one side of an equation, I need to do to the other. Okay, so when I get to this step, to get down to just x, I need to take the square root of both sides. Now by taking the square root of this right-hand side, that's an inverse operation. It's just going to get rid of that exponent. Okay, x squared, taking the square root of x squared is going to leave me with just x. Over here, I'm now left with the square root of 41. Now 41 does not have any factors that are perfect squares, which means the square root of 41 cannot be simplified. We're just going to leave our answer as is. Looking at our next example, here, the missing part is a leg. So I have here are the two legs of my triangle. And again, the hypotenuse is across from the right angle or this slanted side. So here's my hypotenuse. And then this setup of my equation is super important where I make sure I put my legs on one side, x squared plus seven squared equal to my hypotenuse squared. x squared plus seven squared is 49. 11 squared is 121. And then solving for x, I'm going to subtract 49 from both sides, which is going to give me 72. And now to get x by itself, I'm going to take the square root of both sides, inverse operation, and I get x equals the square root of 72. Now 72, so unlike the square root of 41 over here, 72 can be simplified, okay? Perfect square that goes into 72 would be 36. And so 72, I'm gonna break apart into 36 times two, and the square root of 36 is six. Okay, so anytime our answer is a radical, we always, always, always want to check to see if we can simplify that radical. And when you watch our next video lesson, you'll see how that applies to the distance formula as well. Okay, so this is really just a review lesson so that we're ready um, to take on what's going to be a big part of this unit.